Good afternoon, and welcome to this event on the role of municipalities in federalism. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jiyun Han, and I'm a research associate at the Institute for Research on Public Policy's Center of Excellence on the Canadian Federation. This event is the fifth in a series created through a partnership between the school and the center on contemporary issues in Canadian federalism. I'll just say a few words to introduce today's discussion, connecting it to the themes presented in the first four events, and then we'll pass it over to the moderator. Let me start by acknowledging that the land from which I'm talking to you is the unceded traditional territory of the Ganyang Kinhaga. I recognize that we all work in different places and therefore you work on a different traditional indigenous territory. Please take a moment to consider the original peoples of the land you are on. Thank you. So far in the series, we've held four events on various contemporary issues in federalism, such as the fundamentals of fiscal federalism and the relationships with Indigenous peoples. All our events have been turned into condensed podcasts that can be listened to on the IRPP.org. If you haven't listened to our past events, I encourage you to do so. Throughout the series, we've explored federalism with a focus on provincial, territorial, and federal governments. Within this context, our speakers have talked about the division of responsibilities and how each level of government has strengths and weaknesses. In our event on economic development and infrastructure, Herb Emery talked about the challenges of financing infrastructure, how funding considerations shouldn't just stop at building infrastructure, but also needs to include the cost of maintenance. He brought forward the question of who would be responsible for paying for the maintenance. Today, we talk about municipal governments and the role they play within the context of federalism. Municipal governments interact with their constituents the most in their day-to-day. -day. Our speakers will talk about the challenges they face in carrying out their responsibilities to their constitu constituents while they grapple with limited funding capacities and governance challenges. Now for the main event, I'll pass it over to our moderator for today, Thomas Hashar. Thomas? Thank you, Ji-Yoon, and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, like June said, my name is Thomas Hatchard. I'm an independent public policy researcher. Uh, my work focuses in particular on intergovernmental relations and the role of municipalities, both here in Canada and around the world. I'm also the former manager of programs and research at the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance. Uh, but most importantly for today, I am the moderator for the great panel that we have uh, for you today. So we have an exciting event planned for you um, with two great experts on municipalities and federalism. But before we get to the main show, I'm gonna just share a bit of logistical information to optimize your viewing experience. Uh, please that we recommend that uh, you disconnect from your VPN or use a personal device to watch the session when possible. And please note that we have simultaneous translation available as well as real-time translation of communications for this event. These services are available through the Web Diffusion platform and you can refer to the reminder email sent by the school to access these options. Uh, we'll be taking questions from the audience today. So if you have any questions for the panel, please go to the top right corner of your screen and click the chat button and enter your question there. Even if you don't see your question appear in the chat, uh, please don't worry, it is getting to us and we'll get to as many questions as we can after the presentations and uh, short Q&A between myself and the panelists. As I mentioned, we have two outstanding speakers today, each with unique expertise on the role of municipalities in the Canadian Federation. First, we have Enid Slack, who is the director of the Institute on Municipal Finance and uh, the Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance. And we also have Kennedy Stewart, who is professor at Simon Fraser University's School of Public Policy and the former mayor of Vancouver. So we're going to proceed in the following manner. Eden, Eden is going to get us started uh, by talking about um, taking us through an overview of the responsibilities of municipal governance, the challenges they face in carrying out these responsibilities and their limited revenue sources. Kennedy is then going to talk about his personal experience during his time as mayor of Vancouver and go through a case study that highlights the intergovernmental relationships municipalities cultivate. We'll then move to a discussion of the issues raised uh, during the presentations and we'll take questions for our panelists and as I mentioned we'll make time for questions from the audience as well. So again it is my pleasure to introduce Enid Slack. Enid over to you. Thank you very much, Thomas, and welcome everybody today. Um, thank you for the invitation to present on the role of municipalities in Canadian federalism. 
so much of the time in Canada, when we talk about federalism, we're talking about the federal and provincial governments. Uh, so much so that I wrote, recently wrote a paper where I referred to municipalities as the forgotten partners in federalism. So thanks to uh, IRPP for remembering municipalities in this series that you're doing on Canadian federalism. So what I would like to do in the time that I have with you this afternoon uh, is provide a bit of a background on what municipalities do and how they pay for it. I know there's a varied audience uh, here and some will know more than others, uh, but I thought I'd start with a basic understanding of what municipalities do. Um, then I want to talk a little bit about whether they're fiscally sustainable or not and what we know about that. Uh, then turn to some of the existing challenges that municipalities in Canada are facing and some of the future challenges that are coming down the road and what all that all means uh, for their continued sustainability. Um, often I stop my presentations here, um, but it's, it's a bit of a negative. There's a lot of challenges. So I want to add some opportunities at the end and be positive in talking about the need to clarify federal, provincial and municipal roles and responsibilities and, and how to improve uh, intergovernmental relations. So let me start with some background, and I think you all know this. Under the Canadian Constitution, powers are divided between the federal government and provincial governments. Municipalities are not recognized in the Constitution, except to the extent that they are the responsibility of the provinces. And that's why we often hear people say municipalities are creatures of the province. Other countries is not necessarily the case. Places like South Africa, Brazil, uh, municipalities do have original powers in the Constitution, uh, but that's not the case in Canada. There are about 3,750 municipal governments in Canada. Yes, I said about because we don't actually know the number because there's no one source of data in this country on local governments. These numbers are collected province by province. So what do municipalities do and how do they pay for it? Uh, this slide is from Statistics Canada. It's based on uh, GFS data, government finance statistics data, which is uh, what is used by the OMF and the OECD. Um, it, the breakdown, unfortunately, is, is not the greatest to understand what municipalities do. Uh, but let me just say some of the things that they do. Transportation, of course, is, is one of the biggest expenditures, and that includes roads and transit and sidewalks and streetlights and bike lanes, etc. Uh, they provide environmental services, so that would be water, sewers, solid waste collection and management and, and disposal, uh, policing, fire, um, parks, recreation, cultural facilities, health services in some municipalities, social housing, planning and development, and in Ontario, municipalities uh, pay for a portion of social and family services. Again, th this is not the greatest uh, uh, graph because it is for all of Canada and there are differences across the country. As I mentioned, social services are cost shared in Ontario at the provincial and municipal levels. Uh, ambulance uh, is similar. Uh, in BC, we were just talking about TransLink, uh, which is not on the city of Vancouver's books, but is but is a regional body. So there are differences um, across the country. Uh, again, each province has its own legislation dealing with municipal governments, and so there are going to be some differences. This shows the distribution of municipal revenues in Canada for the last uh, 10 or so years. Uh, the main sources of revenue are property taxes, which accounts for over 40% of municipal revenues, uh, user fees, which are around 20%, and intergovernmental transfers. And you can see throughout this period from 2009 to 2020, the distribution of revenues um, is pretty similar. Uh, things begin to change in 2020. Of course, this is during the pandemic. 
uh, for the large cities in particular, transit fare revenues fell. That would appear in user fees. So you can see that user fee revenues went down from about 23% of municipal revenues to 20%. At the same time, transfers, and these are federal and provincial transfers, went up from about 20% to 25%. So if I were to do 21, 22, 23, and, and uh, into the future, um, it's hard to know uh, what that's going to look like. You know, Will the federal and provincial governments continue to support municipalities uh, after the pandemic is over? Um, there are some other revenues. Again, there are differences in the, across the country. So in Toronto, for example, which is governed by the City of Toronto Act from 2006, uh, they're allowed to levy some other taxes like a municipal land transfer tax, which they do, vehicle registration fees, which they did for a couple of years and then stopped. Uh, a municipal accommodation taxes, hotels and Airbnbs, for example, billboard taxes. They can levy a commercial parking levy, which they're talking about now, but uh, haven't done. And then taxes on alcohol, tobacco and amusement. So some other revenue sources available uh, to Toronto. So what are the rules and responsibilities of federal and provincial governments with respect to local governments? Well, as I said in the Constitution, the federal government has no uh, role to play with municipalities. Local governments are come under provincial jurisdiction. However, the federal government can spend money, and it can spend money in municipalities, and it does. So, for example, it provides transfers under the Canada Community Building Fund, which we used to call the gas tax transfer, and it can create incentives through these transfers and it can impose in conditions on these funds. Um, it is worth noting here that when we look at federal provincial transfers and compare them to federal municipal transfers, federal municipal are largely conditional and largely for capital purposes, whereas federal provincial tend to be more of the unconditional variety. The federal government has also engaged with cities and provinces through tri-level agreements dating back to the 1980s. So there were site-specific agreements. You may recall the urban development agreements that were targeting specific neighborhoods uh, doing economic development. They uh, were used in Vancouver, Edmonton, and Winnipeg. There are also sector-oriented agreements that implement national programs on homelessness and immigration, for example, um, and these are through local governance entities, and these were done in a few large and medium-sized cities. But the provincial government has a much larger role to play when it comes to municipalities. They can create or dissolve municipalities. And, you know, I, I used to give this presentation in other places about the role of the province, and I used to say create or eliminate municipalities. And in some countries that I went to, I got into a lot of trouble for saying eliminate. So I've used the word dissolve instead. But we've seen municipal amalgamations most recently in New Brunswick um, in the 1990s in Ontario. And the province can uh, create municipalities, amalgamate municipalities, restructure municipalities, even if the municipalities uh, don't want that to happen. They can change municipal ward boundaries, which happened in Toronto in 2018, where the province uh, reduced the number of wards from 44 to 25. Uh, this was uh, appealed to the the courts, it went all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada, uh, which ruled that the province can do this. Provincial legislation determines what municipalities should be spending money on, what are their responsibilities, and what taxes they can levy. Um, in all provinces, uh, provincial governments stipulate that municipalities cannot run an operating deficit. They have to balance their budget on operating, um, which is true in most places around the world at the municipal level. Provincial governments restrict municipal borrowing about how much municipalities can borrow, what are the debt limits. Uh, this doesn't apply to Toronto, but the rest of Ontario, for example, uh, debt charges cannot exceed 25% of own source revenues. And of course, the province gives unconditional transfers based on formulas and conditional transfers, uh, mainly for transportation, environment, and social services. So if we look at all three 
orders of government, and I've got a, a, a graph here of the share of all taxes, we can see that the federal government accounts for 45% of the taxes we pay, provincial government for 45%, and municipal governments for 10%. Now, I'd like to have a similar chart on expenditures, but I can only tell you that the federal government accounts for 29% of total expenditures of all orders of government, and provincial and local combined account for 71%. I can't break those two down. Um, but I think it's clear um, that there is some evidence of a vertical fiscal imbalance. And uh, local governments, by the way, own more than 60% of public infrastructure in this country. And I think you may have heard that in the previous session on infrastructure. So how do we summarize all of this? Well, when it comes to municipalities, the federal government has the money, the provincial governments have the powers, and the municipalities have the responsibilities. So that's a quick summary of, of the background. So the next question is, are municipalities fiscally sustainable? Well, at our Institute on Municipal Finance and Governance, IMFG, we've spent a lot of time looking at this question of the fiscal health of cities in Canada and in other parts of the world. Um, back in 2015, uh, we edited a book called Is Your City Healthy? Measuring Urban Fiscal Health. And we found that prior to the pandemic, by and large, Canadian cities were fiscally healthy. Well, what, what do we mean by that? Well, they balanced their operating budgets, but as I told you before, they're required to do that by law. Property taxes, which are the, is the main source of revenue to local governments, have not increased very much, uh, generally at or below the rate of inflation. Tax arrears are very small in Canada for the property tax. And believe me, I've looked at property tax arrears in other countries, and uh, they are very low in Canada. People pay their property taxes, by and large. And municipalities don't borrow very much. They generally haven't borrowed up to the allowable provincial limit. So by all of these types of measures, local governments look fiscally healthy. But we concluded from the work we did that this fiscal health may have been at the expense of the overall health of municipalities. And by that, I mean we're seeing increasing evidence of declining service levels and deteriorating infrastructure. These are things that are harder to get measures of. We're starting to do a little bit of a better job, um, but we are seeing infrastructure deteriorating. So yes, we balance the books. Yes, property taxes are low, uh, but at what cost? If we fast forward to the pandemic, there were added pressures on expenditures. So for example, social service expenditures, expenditures on public health, uh, expenditures to improve IT so people could work from home. Uh, a lot of these expenditures went up, some went down because people were not coming into the office. Uh, but there was also a decline in revenues and particularly in the large cities, uh, the decline in transit revenues really put a hole in, in their budgets. And so local governments were facing operating deficits. And as I showed you in the earlier chart, federal and provincial governments came to the rescue. But the question remains, are, fis are local governments fiscally sustainable going forward? So I would like to talk about some of the existing and future challenges that, that municipalities are up against. I'm going to list five. There are many more, but I, you know, I am time limited here, so I'm not going to go into uh, more than five. Uh, some of these are existing. Some of them are short term. Some of them are long term. Some of them are future challenges. So I'm going to talk about inflation and rising interest rates, the infrastructure deficit, which I started to talk about, climate change the uh, work from home phenomenon and online retail and immigration and refugee settlement. Let's start with some of the macroeconomic uh, uh, issues. Uh, inflation, and we can see a chart on inflation here, it's been going up, starting to come down a bit. 
But it means for municipalities that the cost of delivering services and infrastructure is going to increase. It has been increasing. We've already seen that in their budgets. It also means that citizens may be having more trouble making ends meet and will turn to local governments for more services. Rising interest rates will mean the cost of borrowing for new infrastructure will increase. These are existing challenges. Uh, we're hoping they are short run challenges, but they certainly are there for now. The second, the infrastructure deficit. This is a, a busy slide, no need to look at it all. It comes from the Financial Accountability Office for Ontario, and it's part of a review they did on municipal infrastructure assets in 2021. The key thing here is in the middle where it says that 55% of these municipal infrastructure assets were in a state of good repair, 55%. That means a staggering 45% were not in a state of good repair. And so the current infrastructure backlog in Ontario municipalities is about $52 billion. What is that? That is the cost of bringing municipal assets that require capital spending into a state of good repair. Now that excludes operating and maintenance expenditures or repair or replacement costs. And that's just Ontario. So you can see the impact of this infrastructure deficit and what it's going to be on local governments. We turn to climate change as the third challenge. And there are two aspects of climate change that are going to affect municipalities. The first is extreme weather events. We have certainly seen cities being impacted by flooding, ice storms, heat waves, tornadoes, and more. And these events result in major municipal cleanup and remediation costs. And of course, municipalities also need to consider measures to avoid approvals for building in locations at risk, like on floodplains. So there's the impact of extreme weather events. Um, and we, we um, IMFG just released a paper last week on the impact on municipalities, looking uh, particularly at British Columbia and Quebec. The second aspect is about GHG emissions, which are rising, and cities are a major source of these emissions. To limit the global temperature increase, we need to cut emissions by half over the next decade to reach net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And again, as I said, cities are a major source of these emissions. So for cities, it means increasing the share of renewable energies, establishing cleaner transportation systems, retrofitting buildings and facilities, and implementing other measures. These measures are going to place a significant financial burden on municipalities. Work from home and online shopping. So the work from home phenomenon began before the pandemic, but was certainly increased dramatically during the pandemic. Um, and, and it's had a, a lot of impacts, but one of them is to potentially impact the commercial property market. And so we're seeing in some cities, particularly in the U.S., that commercial property values are falling, and by extension, commercial property taxes. If commercial property values fall relative to residential property values, there will be increasing pressure on the residential property tax in the future. And I don't have to tell you, and Kennedy can wade in at some point, about how hard it is to increase residential property taxes. It's a very visible tax. People know what they pay, and it's very hard to increase it. But this work from home phenomenon and also online shopping, which has also reduced commercial property values, um, is going to affect the property tax base. Well, if it's a big question mark. What's going to happen in the future? Are people going to continue to work from home? Are they going to work from home part of the time? We don't yet know how this is going to play out. Um, but there is a potential impact on the largest uh, source of revenue for local governments, which is the property tax. And the last challenge I'm going to talk about is immigration and refugee settlement. And, you know, this chart showing the recent uh, government commitment to, to increasing 
uh, the, the uh, number of new permanent residents uh, to 500,000 a year. So Canada has been increasing its immigration targets. People settle in cities, they need services, they need housing, they need public health, they need social services. And many of these costs are borne by municipalities, even though they don't have any say over how many people are coming to their municipalities. So all of these challenges will mean higher expenditures for local governments, and in some cases, lower revenues. So I said it was going to be a little discouraging when I went through all of these challenges. So let's talk about what the opportunities are going forward. What do we need to do? And I will mention two things. One is to reconsider who does what, and the other is to improve intergovernmental relations. So who does what? We need to clarify the roles and responsibility of all orders of government, but particularly the provincial and local governments. What do municipalities do best? What do provinces do best? Where can they work together? And what resources do municipalities need to fulfill their responsibilities? And I have to say, I was on something called the Who Does What panel in Ontario in 1996, and we talked a lot about separating responsibilities, like the provinces should do all of this and municipalities should do all of this. But these, these services that are provided are very intertwined and the funding is very intertwined. And I don't think we can necessarily separate them, but we do have to clarify who's doing what and how we're paying for it. So municipalities, you know, why, why do we need to review who does what? Well, I think I've made the case that municipalities have inadequate revenue sources and insufficient fix, fiscal flexibility to meet their responsibilities. So for example, in Ontario, we're using property taxes to pay for some of the social service costs that municipalities incur. Is that the best way to pay for it? Uh, secondly, municipalities often lack the power to make decisions on their own. And thirdly, there are unclear and overlapping jurisdictions between orders of government, which leads to poorly coordinated programs and disputes over responsibility. And we see the blame game, you know, it's not our fault, it's, it's their fault. This slide here is from a paper we did a few years back um, on clarifying responsibilities. And this slide shows uh, how the costs are shared for different services in Ontario. And in the top row, you can see things that the local governments are largely responsible for in funding themselves, like fire, parks and recreation, uh, libraries and culture, etc. cetera. Um, but when you get to the bottom row, you see a, a lot of cost shared programs. So ambulance is, is shared with the province, long-term care, public health, social assistance, and childcare. And so, you know, we thought about all of these areas that where there's cost sharing and, and thought about the question of, um, you know, who, who does what and how do we pay for it? So we've done a series of papers on the municipal role in various uh, areas. So papers on housing and economic development, climate policy, public health, policing. Um, and we're continuing this series for another year uh, to see what is the appropriate role uh, for each order of government in these different areas, and, and then how um, how to pay for it and, and who does what. And again, um, we have to think about when we're clarifying responsibilities, uh, improving intergovernmental relations. And here's a series of studies, and you'll see Thomas Hatcher's name on many of them, uh, because when he was at IMFG, he, he authored these uh, papers. And uh, as he noted in his introduction, uh, this is one of his interests, uh, intergovernmental relations, both in Canada and around the world. Um, municipalities need to be directly involved in negotiations and agreements on issues that affect them. So these are things like infrastructure, immigration, public health, but they are largely absent from Canada's system of intergovernmental relations. They're generally excluded from intergovernmental councils or committees, such as first ministers meetings or ministerial tables. In the most recent paper that, that Thomas authored, he suggests ways to strengthen trilateral relations, 
So for example, uh, through various types of trilateral agreements, and I talked about a few before, location-specific agreements, like the um, urban development agreements that we used to have, or policy-specific trilateral agreements, uh, but also sectoral-specific trilateral intergovernmental councils or a general trilateral council, like the first minister's uh, meetings. There's also an important discussion to be had about the revenue sources for municipalities, and that's the area that I work in the most. Um, as we saw at the beginning of this presentation, municipalities are increasingly delivering a much wider range of services than they ever have, but they have very few sources of revenue to pay for them. So let me conclude by just saying, uh, by way of summary, that municipalities are on the front lines when it comes to delivering essential services. And we certainly saw that during the pandemic but they have limited revenue sources. Municipal fiscal sustainability is being threatened by the existing and future challenges that I mentioned, but also many others. This means that in the longer term, we need to think about who does what and how to pay for local services. And I think all three orders of government need to come together to figure this out. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you so much, Enid. We'll now go to Kennedy for his perspective. So, Kennedy, over to you. Great. Uh, thanks so much. And what a treat. Uh, I never <laughs> tire of hearing uh, your expertise, Enid. And thanks so much for that wonderful uh, presentation. And uh, discouraging as it is, you did kind of pick it up at the end, which is great. So, thank you. Uh, before I begin, of course, I want to acknowledge I'm on the uh, unseated uh, territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Slave Tooth people, and thank them for their generosity to all of us who live on, on their lands. Uh, my, uh, my talk today is about uh, what I'm calling end-run federalism, or uh, perhaps uh, backdoor federalism. I'll leave you to figure out which, uh, which title you like the best. And essentially, it's uh, I'm thinking of, of the audience here, who's uh, federal civil servants, from what I understand. Um, uh, and really, what I want to... Uh, talk about today is how you can better utilize municipal governments uh, to make your bosses happy. How you can work with municipalities to get stuff done, uh, even in the face of, of provincial opposition. I'm going to use uh, drug decriminalization as an example of, of this end run federalism, and then uh, conclude a bit with, uh, with uh, some lessons that you might want to take away from, from this example. So in terms of backgrounds, I'm trying to put myself in, in your seats, uh, is that uh, you face two scenarios in your everyday work. First, you are uh, implementing a proactive initiative, such as outlined in your minister's mandate letter. So uh, perhaps somebody on this, uh, on this call, on the Zoom meeting, uh, was uh, read in the minister's mandate letter that, hey, you've got to legalize cannabis. So that's a proactive measure that kind of comes out of politicians' heads, and you have to uh, make that happen. And then you have to think through, well, how do I make that happen? Uh, the second uh, scenario that you'd face in your everyday work is you're responding to an emerging issue. That's something that's not in your mandate letters. Uh, it's not dreamed up by your minister. It's something that has to uh, that's happening to the environment that you have to deal with. So that could be COVID or climate change or truckers convoys, or salmon lice or housing crises. It's it's everything that's thrown your way in your ministry uh, that you have to deal with. And I I would say that ten percent of what you do is proactive, and about ninety percent of what you do is is reactive. Uh, so those are the things that. Uh, you know, when you're looking at your to-do list, most of those things would be connected to uh, one of those two types of, of um, activities. But the bottom line is, whether it's proactive or reactive, uh, you have to get stuff done for your minister and uh, think of creative ways to uh, bring change. So uh, I've never uh, been in provincial government, but I have, uh, you know, I was in the House of Commons for seven years as an MP and has served as mayor for four. And prior to that, I was a professor and back at Simon Fraser now, but uh, specialized in local governments. Um, 
So from my perspective, sitting in the House of Commons, looking at that beautiful stained glass for seven years, uh, Ottawa is a very theoretical place. And what, what kind of drives that home to me is when uh, MPs will be making speeches about stuff and they'll go, and this initiative is going to cost $20 million. Whoops, I mean $20 billion. And you'd never hear that in a, in a local government. It is that much of what's being spoken about is theoretical. Uh, you're often talking about sweeping policy reforms. Uh, for example, we're going to make sure all uh, reserves have water by the end of our mandate. Again, sweeping policy, uh, big um, uh, you know, promises. You're uh, often talking about regulation or expenditure. Those are the couple of things you're, 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 uh, you kind of your starting points, and you're at, of course, ten thousand feet. You're thinking of the entire country and often uh, the world. At the provincial level, it's kind of half theoretical, half practical. You, you do have your ten thousand uh, foot um, view from uh, thinking of your province, and, but you do deliver some direct services, so you, you actually are on the ground. Uh, municipalities are all practical. Occasionally, uh, we'll talk about world peace or something, but mostly you're you're arguing about uh, service delivery and and how to best use the scarce dollars that uh, that Edith uh, uh, outlined so well. Um, so you're constantly under a fire at the municipal level. There's uh, you know these are especially in larger cities. Um, you're, you know, I would say uh, normally you're working kind of 60 hour weeks, but in things like when COVID hit completely unexplained, uh, unanticipated uh, disasters, uh, that level of work goes up uh, considerably. And it's, uh, and often you're kind of winging it because the federal and provincial governments haven't worked out what they're going to do yet. But you're, you have to deal with, uh, hey, what do we do to get PPE to our frontline responders? Um, feds and province are kind of talking about how that happens. But meanwhile, you're scrambling to try to get masks on cops and firefighters. So um, we don't get the luxury of the theory at the municipal level. And but I would say that municipalities are an underutilized resource for uh, federal policymakers and and those who implement federal policy. So, um, so let's talk about municipalities as willing but un underutilized uh, partners. Uh, first of all, my experience is federal and provincial governments are rarely good friends, uh, and they're often uh, adversarial. They often see each other as adversaries. If you look at the latest uh, health agreement where uh, the provinces were demanding so much for so long and then the feds just came in and said, here's your money, take it or leave it kind of thing. Uh, not, not a lot of, uh, you know, not a lot of hugging and backslapping going on at any of these uh, meetings. Uh, actually, I had one uh, provincial health minister brag to me once how he had never met with his federal colleague and kind of held that up as a point of pride. So, so there is also personal divisions between these uh, ministers and, and uh, really, um, I would say, honest collaboration between those two levels of government is rare. Uh, it's only when one side can force the other to, to do something that something happens. Uh, on the other hand, though, municipalities are desperate to take help from anybody. <laughs> they, if they have so many problems to deal with all the time, if you can come up with any idea that will help them uh, deliver, uh, you know, to solve a local problem, then they'll take it. Now, municipalities used to be really scared of, of provincial governments. Uh, I would say it's they're less scared now. Uh, Enid's slide showed uh, about you know the distribution of a of a provincial of, of a municipal budget. And most of it's uh, property taxes followed by user fees, but it used to be that um, operating budgets, uh, direct uh, grants from federal and provincial governments, used to make up uh, mostly provincial governments made up a, a much larger portion of the municipal operating budgets, and that really scared municipalities because they were worried that that money would disappear if they if they displeased the province. But now, uh, for example, the city of Vancouver, uh, geez, it must be under 10% is, is direct money uh, from the province, probably less than that. Uh, so you're not really scared of the province anymore. You're, they're, they may, uh, you know, 
what did what you say? You know, destroy the local government. They may eliminate the local government, but that's that's not going to happen. Uh, so really, there's you can you can be a bit more brash as a municipal government because you're not as worried as uh, uh, about provincial punishment. They might say mean things about you, but they they don't really. Ha- they're not going to use the nuclear option uh, very often. So in the past, uh, when a lot more money came from the province, if the feds gave money directly to the to the municipalities, the province could just get it back by cutting the municipal grants. They would just take that money away. Uh, and so then the question is, well, what's the point uh, if you're if you're a federal uh, government, why would you do that? But that's not the, really the case anymore. And the provinces can do really very little uh, to threaten, to fiscally threaten municipalities. So um, I know that the federal, uh, you know, federal departments will of, often uh, cooperate with non-governmental organizations, but I would say increasingly municipalities would be a better option uh, because they actually do have quite a lot of entrenched power and uh, quite big workforces that can, can't can actually deliver. But to do this, uh, to make municipalities your partner or to, to woo them over, you're going to have to use your imagination. So I'm going to walk you through a case study, uh, which is uh, about drug decriminalization here in the province of British Columbia, uh, really my take about how that came to be. And then uh, hopefully that will trigger your imagination as to how you can get stuff done for your minister uh, by cooperating and working with municipalities. Uh, so here in British Columbia, we've had a massive spike in illicit drug-related deaths. Uh, in 2013, uh, we had 334 of these types of deaths, but in 2022, uh, province-wide, that spiked to 2,272 deaths uh, in the province. So that is a death rate, which is a terrible um, phrase, but that's uh, what it's called, a death rate from uh, 7.2 deaths per 100,000 to 43 deaths uh, per 100,000 uh, British Columbian residents. And if you saw this in any other area, you you would think it's it's catastrophic. Uh, I do with drugs, but it's a very difficult, uh, stigmatized topic to talk about. So um, it that's 12,000 deaths over a 10-year period. Uh, with the average age of death being 44. So it is now, uh, you know, uh, these illicit drug related deaths is now the biggest killer of young people in British Columbia and increasingly uh, Alberta, Saskatchewan, and Ontario. Um, coming back to British Columbia, despite the well documented uh, proof of these uh, in- increase in deaths, the province of BC w- seemed very reluctant to act in any kind of big way. They, uh, their initial response, there was a um, state of emergency declared a public health emergency in 2016, and then a massive distribution of Narcan or naloxone, whatever you want to call it. So like if you run into somebody that's overdosing, uh, then you would hit them with naloxone and then they would come back to, you know, come back to, to life and then go through the hospital and recover. Um, that seemed to be the, the biggest way that the province was dealing with this. Uh, but what we were seeing increasingly was, of course, uh, all fire services, uh, who are the main responders to uh, overdoses, uh, were just getting uh, crushed. Uh, the uh, the suicide rates of firefighters that responding was was skyrocketing, as was uh, sick leave and, and frankly just leaving uh, the job entirely because uh, in my municipality, but increasingly small ones across the province and in rural areas, uh, firefighters that was the the bulk of their job is is basically responding to to these uh, overdoses and deaths. Just to give you an example of this practically, um, every Monday morning uh, when I was mayor, I would get an email that came in to to tell me how many people died the previous week uh, from uh, illicit drug uh, overdoses. Uh, And they would, these emails would tell me how many resuscitations had been undertaken by the fire department. And these are mostly undercounts. So, for example, you know, one week it'd be 14 deaths and 150 resuscitations, the next to be 10 deaths and 120 resuscitations, 12, 11, 2, 5, 6, like every week this would come in. And then we'd have between 100 and 200 resuscitations by the fire department, which was, um, you know, just devastating to think these are these are real people. Um, 
why why it was hard for uh, frontline responders is they would actually save somebody's life once, twice, you know, maybe up to ten times, and then that uh, person would die on the eleventh time. So they've created a bond with this person that they've saved, and then and the person's dead. So that is uh, not the federal or provincial view on on this. Uh, really, I would say the biggest public health the disaster and one of them anyway in Canada's history. But at the municipal level, it's it's very real. And, you know, I was the head of a big city, um, but when this is happening in small municipalities, you know, you're a mayor with a clerk and a thousand residents, uh, it is it is completely overwhelming, especially when your firefighters uh, are volunteers. Um, so, uh, I started to get more active on this. Uh, I was elected at the end of 2018 and in 2019, I was looking for, I had a task force on what to do here. Uh, but uh, in November 20, uh, 2019, I saw that a new federal cabinet was being sworn in. And so I had my MPs pinned. So I went to Ottawa on that day to access the halls uh, to run into ministers. And I ran into uh, Patty Haydu, who was uh, elected, uh, sorry, just appointed as the Minister of Health uh, in, in uh, November 2019. And we, we talked a bit about this, uh, what to do. Didn't hear much. But then uh, the overdose deaths began to spike as uh, COVID started to uh, come in to, uh, to hit us uh, hard as well. Uh, that's because of the physical distancing and other, other measures we had to take. So um, the minister called me in the summer to explore, you know, what perhaps we could do about this and then called again and said it would be uh, legal for us as, the, as a city to apply for a federal health exemption to decriminalize drugs. That would be within our own boundaries, and we could do it without provincial approval. So her uh, civil servants had done the work to, to review this, uh, both uh, review the um, the legislation around uh, health exemptions, uh, the, the, done all the legal footwork beforehand, before uh, she approached me as, as this being a, a possible, uh, one possible policy solution. So, of course, I jumped on this. I put uh, a motion forward to council uh, a couple months later in November, and we submitted our application to Health Canada by March 2021 with our final application in May 2021. Uh, the province was playing this very weird game where they um, they uh, had said they were in favor of decriminalization, but only if it was a national uh, initiative. They would not do it on their own turf, uh, but they panicked when we put ours in. When the city of Vancouver put in our application for decriminalization, they panicked, and then they put in their own uh, application for a province-wide exemption uh, in a year later, uh, November 2021, and it was eventually approved by the uh, new uh, Minister of um, Mental Health and Addictions, uh, Minister Bennett, in May uh, 2022. Uh, so... You know, this has now come into force. It's been into force for uh, not quite a couple of weeks yet. And we have, uh, I guess, a new tool uh, to fight uh, this terrible scourge of, of uh, illicit uh, drug-related deaths uh, in the province. And maybe it'll work, maybe it won't work, maybe it'll do a little something, but at least we're, we're trying something uh, new. And it was all about, uh, really, it was about... Um, you know, developing re relationships with the municipality, uh, the, f the federal civil servants doing a bunch of work that my civil servants could never do because we don't have the capacity, uh, and then coming to us with a, with a proposal. Uh, it did uh, it did entail some risk for the minister, uh, who is uh, Minister Haydu, who is no longer a uh, health minister, and me, who's no longer mayor. <laughs> so there are uh, prices to pay for these types of things, but... Um, you know, that's the way the ball bounces. Uh, so uh, large municip municipalities, especially large ones, uh, and here's some lessons from this, are powerful allies, uh, mainly because we're elected in the same areas where there are federal seats. So if you think, uh, you know, there's six federal seats within the, uh, the city of Vancouver, there's probably 25 at least within the, the jurisdiction of, of uh, you know, Toronto. Uh, large cities uh, are important to... Uh, political parties because of the number of seats that are at stake. Uh, 
so that's an important thing to know that we can gain access to ministers, uh, prime minister, deputy prime minister, because uh, they're worried that politically and, and mayors are attuned to this, uh, uh, the desire to get reelected um, and understanding th their own political power. Uh, we're all desperate. Uh, municipalities are desperate to solve our local problems, but we have very little policy capacity. Uh, so at the city of Vancouver, we do not have an economist. Uh, we don't have policy teams. Our IGR teams, uh, governmental relation teams are are good, but they're junior. Uh, you know, they're not uh, expert lobbyists. So they would not have the funds to go to Ottawa and kind of lobby. Uh, so there's very little capacity to proactively pitch um, uh, you know, innovative policy uh, solutions. Uh, we don't have time to sift through federal statutes. Uh, this is even the big cities. And we, we really don't have time to figure out the granting streams. Um, it was interesting when I would meet with ministers, the first thing we'd get with the deputy minister sitting uh, beside the minister is the uh, just kind of an outline of the funding possibilities that are there. And, you know, my eyes would glaze over because I just, I just, but I would say we need money for this thing, and then the the federal uh, deputy minister would figure out which stream that would fit into. So, for example, um, I needed funding for my uh, the Vancouver Art Gallery here. Uh, went to a bunch of ministers, didn't know where this would fit. Finally, we got twenty five million out of a green building fund. I would have never guessed to apply to that, uh, but the but the federal civil servants figured out. Uh, how to help uh, on that particular area and many, many others. So that is uh, really a lesson is to, is to go uh, to the municipalities with um, proposals that are already built to succeed that follow on either your proactive uh, or your reactive mandates. Uh, small municipalities have really uh, very little capacity at all. I mean, even as a larger municipality, I find it difficult to uh, talk with uh, you know, there's 21 municipalities in, in Metro uh, Metro Vancouver. It, it's very hard for me to go talk to, say, Port Coquitlam, that has 65,000 people, uh, because the it's the mayor and the manager and the clerk, but really no policy staff. So they're they're really not much capacity for policy innovation at those small levels. But if I'm doing something that Port Coquitlam sees, they will copy our policy. So, for example, on ride uh, hailing, uh, which was, you know, very unpopular in British Columbia, the taxi industry was pushing back against it. Vancouver, we brought ride sharing um, into Vancouver first. Everybody was mad at us, and then they all adopted the same policy that we had. So if you can make some movement within one municipality within a region, you'll probably get others uh, copying copying the policies. Um the, the most professional staff we have are planners and engineers, but you don't want them doing drug policy. Engineers, you know, great at, at what they do, planners great at what they do, but they're they don't, they're not policy experts. And often the policies you get really reads like it was designed by an engineer. <laughs> it's uh, we had, uh, for example, we had a road pricing uh, a proposal that was just politically totally untenable. Um, and, uh, you know, engineers know this, how, but when, you know, know how to do it uh, physically, how to put cameras in and that type of stuff, but that they don't have the kind of uh, the, the political kind of eyes on this uh, about how to make things happen. Uh, in terms of the uh, large policy changes that you might see, so for example, Enid's ideas for, for uh, different types of funding, you can go through the Federation of Canadian Municipalities for this. But you have to remember the Federation of Canadian Municipalities is largely controlled by smaller municipalities. And often uh, there's um, tension between the smaller, less populated and the more populated uh, municipalities. And the FCM tends to miss granular stuff because by nature, they're a large association. Uh, there is the Big City Mayor's Caucus, however, which um, well, didn't really do tons until COVID. And then... Uh, Basically, uh, that became a kind of a go-to place for senior ministers uh, with when they would uh, pull us together, the big city mayors, to talk about everything from CERB to uh, transit bailouts to, uh, you know, uh, any other thing that was happening to us under COVID. So, so again, FCM, great place, a very powerful lobby uh, group when it comes to uh, 
large scale policy change, mostly around funding, but the big city mayor is probably a, a more effective subgroup when it when it comes to policy change. Um, if you get the big city mayors on board, then you're usually in pretty good shape as a minister when you're trying to sell this to cabinet. Um, so that's it for me. Uh, I'm uh, really uh, happy that you've had a chance to listen to this. I'm looking forward to uh, hearing your questions. Thanks so much. Thank you, Kennedy. Um, and yes, we will jump into some questions. And just as a reminder to everyone, feel free to send in your questions for either Kennedy or Enid or both, and uh, they will be routed to me and we'll, we'll get to as many of them as, as we can. Before we jump, we get to that, um, I have a few questions for the two of you. And I wanted to start, Kennedy, maybe by jumping off from, it's a really interesting case study you presented. And, um, and I thought it was interesting the way you spoke about sort of the relationship development that is important as part of uh, the federal municipal um, intergovernmental relations. And, you know, from, from my own research, I think if we simplify things a bit, there's sort of two poles of intergovernmental relations that you can have. There's can be sort of very open-ended, ongoing conversations, whether it's at an intergovernmental table or through MOUs, and there can be very sort of policy specific project specific, specific relations uh, or projects that that get involved um, that the municipalities and and other governments get involved in and I was hoping maybe to start with you and then Enid can jump in if you can speak about the separate value of each of these and as I said I was interested in in terms of as if, if relationship development is an important part to have if you're then going to be able to do a project maybe speak to sort of how each of these can can help with that piece of it as well. Okay, um, so I think both are important. I, I do think that uh, big scale policy change change is important, and um, uh, how I, you know, that's where the Federation of Community Municipalities comes in. They're a very important tool for building consensus among municipalities, and then presenting uh, proposals to the federal government for um, for approval. Um, most of those are money asks, I would say. So give us more money for transit, give us more money for infrastructure, give us more money. So, so I mean, you can kind of anticipate what they're going to come up with. Um, so I, I don't know uh, on those ones. It just requires you to make the federal government to make a decision of whether they're going to fund this stuff or not. Usually you get good return for your money, like good value for your money. But uh, it's the individual policy stuff, uh, really, that, that I think... Um, that if if the folks on the on the call here are working for individual ministers, it's it's the individual policy uh, uh, that I think um, perhaps can shift things forward. Uh, you know, less standard things forward, not the big money ask, but but actual policy change, whether it's regulation change or or uh, is so. I I would think, how do you develop those relationships? Well, you know, at the at the local level, you should. Uh, encourage your mayors to actually go and meet uh, ministers if they can, uh, but also for ministers to reach out to starting with the large municipalities in the province, and then you'll start to get a bit of a buzz. Um, the The province, the provincial officials may not like that too much, but they can't do anything about it, so I think it's probably worth the risk. There are also um, uh, gatherings of city managers across uh, Canada, uh, you know, provincially or, or or nationally, and those are also a good place for probably civil servants to go and to the to the wine and cheese uh, places to 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 build up relationships at uh, at those meetings. But but the the relationship can help a lot if if you have some trust that's developed. And and again, municipalities are desperate to get stuff done, so um, it won't take much to build trust with them. Right, Ina, did you want to jump in on that as well? Well, you know, I, I agree with Kennedy that you really need both. I mean, you need the sector-specific, location-specific agreements uh, to deal with specific issues, like we talked about immigration and refugee settlement or public health. Um, but, but I think I think you also need the the more open-ended engagement, uh, not just to ask money, but to to understand the challenges that municipalities face on an ongoing basis. And these are going to change over time. You know, I listed some, those will increase, some will, some will hopefully go away. But, but I think 
you know, the three orders of government need to talk about the issues, problems, and challenges that, that are likely to arise. And we don't know what they are yet. So you can't have a table on a specific topic if you don't know what the topic is going to be. And I think there needs to be an understanding that when the national government does something, it affects municipalities. So if it increases the number of people coming to Canada, for example, it has to understand that there are costs to the municipality of doing that. But what local governments do also affects the country, right? And, and, and the federal government, you know, some of their housing policies or, or land use planning may affect the climate and, 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 and climate change issues. So, so I think, you know, this general understanding of, of what's facing municipalities and, you know, the end run around the province, you know, Kennedy and I may may debate that, you know, I think at the end of the day, you know, from what I've saying earlier, the provinces have a lot of powers over municipalities still, in terms of what they can do. And so I think, you know, sometimes they, you can't do an end run, you need to include them to get the powers you need. And, and governments change, right? Um, so sometimes, the feds will get along with the province and the, sometimes they don't, you know, like I think everybody needs to be at the table to sort this out. That makes sense. I guess jumping from that um, about the the power of, of the, the provinces and, and I did find it interesting, the, the Kennedy, you were, your comment about how that has slowly shifted over time with, with um, in terms of the, the revenue sources that the municipalities have. Um, there was an interesting survey I saw recently. There's a survey called the Municipal Barometer, and it's and it surveys municipal officials um, across the country and uh, around a, a number of different issues. They they did a recent set of questions that were around revenue sources, intergovernmental relations, and what was interesting about that, and you know, jumping in it from what from you were saying there about the powers of provinces, but also what your presentation showed about the sort of limited revenue sources when they were asked when, and these are mayors and, and councillors, when they were asked about the preferred choice for how to increase revenues, the preference, the, the overwhelming preference was to get more grants from the provincial and federal governments rather than having access to other new sort of own source revenues, whether that's you know, at the big side of things, an income tax and a sales tax, or even, you know, development charges and those options. So I was hoping to ask both of you a question around this. So Enid, you know, I thought maybe you could just speak a bit about that division about when grants are most appropriate, when the sort of own source revenues are most appropriate, especially given the challenges that you laid out for that, that municipalities are going to be facing. But Kenny, I was really interested also afterwards, maybe you can speak about, as you've noted this question of the, or the what you see as a trend where municipalities are less afraid of the of the provinces and you know they're less reliant on the revenues. I mean, I'd be interested in your perspective as to maybe why there still seems to be a preference for grants over own source revenues in terms of collecting more and, and whether you, know, you see any issues with that. So maybe I'll start with you, Enid, and we'll go to Kennedy. Okay, thank you. So, so I may not have the same view as as the uh, the people who were surveyed in the barometer survey, uh, because it's easy for me to sit here and say, well, I think municipalities should raise their own revenues and be accountable uh, uh, for those revenues. You know, if they they decide what they're going to spend their money on, then they should be responsible for raising that money. And there's a certain accountability there. Um, th that I kind of like, but I don't have to get elected, so I don't have to worry about raising taxes. But but even in my world with more own source revenues, there are justifications for transfers from uh, federal and provincial governments. Uh, there are many, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but let me talk about three. The first is, is sort of an economic efficiency argument, which is based on externalities. So, you know, services that a particular municipality provides, uh, the benefits of those services may spill over municipal boundaries. So, for example, I'm in a municipality, I want to build a road. Um, I'm not interested in the benefits to people outside of my municipality because they're not paying for it. I'm only interested in the benefits inside my municipality. And so I may not provide the amount of road that is needed overall if I'm just looking at my own municipality. So if, say, 30% of the benefits of that road spill over the municipal boundary, there may be a role for the provincial government to come in and, and subsidize 30% of the expenditures. 
There may be benefits that extend beyond provincial boundaries, in which case there would be a rule for the federal government uh, to fund a certain percentage of the municipal expenditures. Now, there may be other ways to do that. Uh, Kennedy talked about tolls. Uh, you know, I'm, you know, in the road example, there there may be other ways. But but to the extent that services have benefits that spill over municipal boundaries, uh, there is an externality, and there's uh, potentially a role for transfers. The second rationale is based on equity, uh, and here I'm talking about horizontal equity. So the idea is that each municipality in a province should be able to provide an average level of service, a standard level of service, by levying an average or standard tax rate. Uh, some municipalities may not be able to do that. Their costs may be higher, their needs may be higher, or their fiscal capacity may be lower. So we're talking here about an equalization grant, basically, um, that is an unconditional grant uh, based on the fiscal capacity, and in some cases, it might be based on the expenditure needs of municipalities. Uh, I believe six provinces in Canada uh, have provincial municipal equalization transfers. We did a paper at IMFG on this as well. Um, a third rationale is to close the gap between the revenues that can be raised at the local level and the expenditures required to cover the assigned local responsibilities. And this is a, a sort of a vertical fiscal gap. I was talking about the horizontal fiscal gap before. This is a vertical gap. And it may, it may arise because local governments are assigned more responsibilities uh, than they can uh, finance uh, from the revenue raising powers that they have at their disposal. So to close that vertical fiscal gap, you get an unconditional grant uh, and that would be appropriate. So there, those are reasons why you might see federal and or provincial transfers to municipalities. Um, you know, there are other reasons. There may be political reasons. I'm not going to go into all of the other reasons, um, but, but those are three. But keep in mind that particularly conditional transfers do distort local decisions. They're meant to do that. Right. So if I'm funding as a federal government, 30 percent of your expenditures on something, I'm going to encourage you to to make expenditures on that function, not on another. And so there's less local autonomy uh, in that case. Um, the other problem with transfers, of course, is they're not stable and predictable. And Kennedy, you know that they, <laughs> uh, they they can be high one year and go down the next. And, you know, municipal expenditures go up sort of in a smooth kind of way over time. Um, but the grants don't always. And, and when grants are cut back, municipalities have to scramble to raise property taxes or user fees um, to make up the difference. Kennedy. Yeah. Your thoughts. Well, my first thought was, you know, what's what's something that a cabinet member want, never wants to hear? Congratulations, you're the new minister of municipal affairs, <laughs> because it is it, basically your job is to manage municipalities, and when there's a lot of them, uh, you know, thirty five hundred, that is a big job, and you're rarely going to approve. Uh, you're rarely going to get approval from municipalities. And every time you go to their annual conventions, you're absolutely going to get hammered uh, by not because you're not doing enough. So that is so really for, from my experience, um, you know, provincial governments see municipalities as kind of a necessary evil that they have to manage rather than a partner. It's not all uh, like, for example, Premier Gordon Campbell uh, way back when didn't see municipalities that way because he was a former mayor. I think Mike Harcourt was the same. So those with municipal experience maybe uh, see municipalities different, but many that don't um, see them as adversaries. And that makes it very difficult to sit down and, and have a talk about, about something. So maybe that's... Uh, you know, maybe that's another angle to look at if you're if you're trying to uh, win municipalities on side is is to see what the relationships are with with the with the province, uh, and um, I, I think the reason why the survey may have said oh please don't give us any more um, of our of our own revenue raising powers is because municipalities don't have policy advisors or economists on staff. It, it they're they're simply like. Like when you, know, you have so much stuff coming at you every day, everything from off-leash dog parks to, you know, <laughs> earthquake preparation, like it's it's everything that you, really your policy analysis is done in the room at the time uh, and you whip through the pros and cons of of uh, of of something that whether you want to go get it proactively or whether you want to you're reacting to an offer 
And one of the things that would come up is if, if you're going to get a slice of the sales tax, then you would have to set the rate. And that would be bad for your reelection uh, possibilities. But if you had economists and and uh, you know uh, proper policy advice, who they would definitely say, no, 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 take this. This is a good thing because then you don't have to increase your property taxes so much. So I do think that if if this is something that um, the provincial or federal governments wanted municipalities to take, uh, either just do it to them or try to uh, build up. Um, you know, uh, some allies. Um, we just here in Vancouver, uh, we won uh, the FIFA World Cup, and uh, I came out and said that we wouldn't spend more than five million dollars uh, locally to host that. I did that proactively without telling the province, so then they were on the hook for paying all the rest of it. Then there was this little mechanism where we could, um, if the municipality requested it, we could put on a hotel room tax that needed to be approved by the province. And the province asked us to do that. We did it. And then now we have a hotel room tax, uh, which is a new revenue source that I would hope would come to the municipality uh, permanently, but uh, we'll see what happens. So uh, again, for me, uh, you know, to get stuff done, sometimes you've got to be aggressive. Uh, and even though you try to tell the province things, often they're the communication channels are not great. Uh, so, you know, give them a heads up before you send out the press release. But uh, uh, other than that, there's not a lot of negotiation beforehand often. That's interesting. We have some good questions from the audience coming in. So I'm just going to ask one more. And Kennedy, to you first, um, just to coming off of what you said there, I think your point is very interesting about municipal capacity and how that actually affects in some senses for what municipalities may ultimately believe is, is reasonable to, to receive in terms of revenue raising capacities or, or anything else. Um, you speak of your presentation was really about, you know, utilizing municipalities, how the federal government can utilize municipalities. I suppose setting aside the question of you know, increasing municipal capacity and I, you know, and how that would happen, but it's taking municipal capacity as it, as it stands. Um, I, you spoke a little bit about how, you know, how to engage municipalities. Can you maybe speak a bit more about how the federal government can engage municipalities meaningfully, both given the capacity that they have and don't have, and also, as you were mentioning, you know, you, you didn't mention there's a lot of, of them, sort of that fragmentation. And I'm curious on that from a perspective as well as, almost, you know, how the strengths of each order of government and sort of what is it that each order of government can bring when you have that relationship, given this, this how, where municipalities are right now? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would say the a tremendous strength of the federal government is the ability for, for policy analysis uh, and designing like incredibly detailed and effective policies. Uh, that is not a strength of municipalities. So I was just thinking, uh, uh, about uh, gun control, uh, how um, <laughs> the federal government just announced uh, out of the blue, I think Bill Blair did this, they were going to ban handguns. And then they got in trouble and they said, well, we're going to let them, we're going to get the municipalities to do it uh, with no consultation with us beforehand. Uh, you know, I'm for that. So I said, absolutely, 100%. But when we got down to the details of how it was going to happen, um, there were none that nobody had thought it through more than uh, from what I know. And I was a I was on board for this, uh, how it was going to happen. So I would say if I was going to do that again, if is to work with the municipality, like one or two would be fine uh, prior to the announcement. And then the municipalities could say with confidence how this would uh, roll out, but don't have the municipal staff do it. Ha have the federal staff uh, understand the uh, the provincial statutes, you know, the local government acts and all that, that kind of stuff. Um, so, so that's what I would say. If 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 you if you want to get stuff done, the provinces aren't cooperating. Uh, you want to go through a municipality, then then do the work beforehand. Even having joint tables, uh, having municipal staff on a working with federal staff, is a big resource drain for municipalities because it takes them off of other files and. You know, the, the other thing that federal governments have is a luxury of time and the ability to bring in a lot more resources if they need them. Uh, municipalities really don't have that uh, option. So federal governments could provide grants to municipalities to hire in consultants or something. That's one way around it. But um, but uh, that's what I would say is it should be worked through, you know, 
in a legal way that you could put in a motion to counsel is the best way to do it, uh, I think, um, rather than having, you know, me doing it at one o'clock in the morning for the council meeting the next day, right? <laughs> and that's often what happens, I think. Right. Um, Nina, did you want to jump on that? I have a couple of audience questions here as well for you, if you want. <laughs> uh, oh, <laughs> well, I'll just say quickly, um, Kennedy talked before about some of the, you know, the Federation of Canadian Municipalities and the Big City Mayor's Caucus and provincial associations and, the, you know, there's rural associations and, and urban associations. Um, but we haven't talked much about regional governance structures. And so, you know, where municipalities can come together in a region, um, you know, that that is sort of a that would really help. And, you know, we we saw this during the pandemic in the greater Toronto and Hamilton area where there were tables where voluntarily uh, uh, people came together for the region to speak for the region. And I think that that's an, another route that that would be interesting to take. So I'm going to jump to the audience here. There's two questions that are slightly related in the sense that they are both about inquiring about the direct relationship between municipalities and the federal government. So the first, um, and Ina, you already spoke to this a little bit, so I'll, I'll leave this to you whether you want to say more about it, but the question is overall, would you say direct conditional funding to municipalities by the federal government is a good thing? But the second question that's related to that, um, that um, I'll throw in as well is, uh, someone's asking about your thoughts on the impact of an increased direct municipal federal relationship on the provincial relationship. In, or, in other words, would it does a direct mun municipal federal relationship distort the provincial relationship in a negative way? So maybe, you know, I'll start with you if you want, if you have anything further to say on the direct conditional funding uh, or the other question, then maybe, and Kennedy, you can jump in on either one after. Okay, thank thank you for that. Uh, thank you for both those questions. I, I will address the first one on conditional grants to municipalities. I think the second one is more of a political question, and so we'll leave that to the former politician. Um, on the conditional grants to municipalities, um, you know, I, I tried to provide a rationale for that. So, you know, for if we're looking at transit, and I know the federal government's interested in transit, one could argue that. Um, if we have good transit systems in our major cities, um, uh, that will increase productivity, and that's important for the whole country. There is an externality there that affects the whole country. So I could see a role for the federal government uh, providing it would have to be conditional funding, but that it's spent on, on transit. I guess the question is, how conditional, what conditions... Uh, how much interference in municipal decision making, uh, you know, we can certainly debate that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, there is a role uh, for that kind of funding. Kenny, did you want to jump in on maybe the, the second question here, which is, um, I'll just repeat it for your sake, whether the, the impact of an increased direct municipal federal relationship on the provincial relationship and whether the direct municipal federal relationship, federal relationship would distort the provincial relationship in a negative way. Yeah, um, but what was popping into my mind when you were talking about this is political cycles. So I had, um, you know, uh, we had a provincial government here, a minority provincial government in, in 2017. Uh, so you never knew when that government was going to go down. Uh, when I was elected in 2018, I had it was I was the first independent mayor in in 30 years. We have uh, we have parties out here in Vancouver. Uh, I've had them since the 30s, uh, but I had not I had no colleagues. <laughs> so so I my uh, my ability to build coalitions was, was limited. Um, so I, I always had to think about that. Of course, we had a federal minority governments too, and so. You know, you don't really have time for long negotiations under those circumstances. You you kind of uh, agree on something quickly and jump at it and and worry about whose nose gets out of joint later. Um, I think otherwise you won't get anything done. Now, in situations where you have a majority on a on a on a city council that's stable, you have majority provincial and federal governments. Maybe that's the time to do uh, longer term thinking. But when you're in kind of a, especially when you throw a pandemic on top of those conditions, it really is, you know. Uh, so maybe that's where you opt for a, a quicker action. That um, that kind of, uh, you know, I don't I don't really know. Um, 
what happened with decriminalization between because it's interesting because uh, Premier Oregon was not really for it. Uh, it was suggested by the, the federal level, but now we have Premier uh, Eby, who is uh, probably more sympathetic. So there's also, um, you know, there's also those kind of personal personalities. Uh, to, but uh, you know, that's that is definitely something we're scoping out before you jump in. So, uh, and I, I think the mayor, whoever you're dealing with, probably your first good point of contact will tell you that. Will tell you, oh, I don't want to do this because this thing is, it'll cost me this. And, but I want, you know, so that, that's also maybe you want to try a couple of municipalities that uh, if you're going to trial run something and you got 3,500 to pick from. So you're going to find somebody that's, you know, going to move ahead with something that you want to do. Great. Uh, another question here um, is I, for either of you, I suppose. I'm wondering if the speakers could share their thoughts on the role of upper levels of government during times of failure at the municipal level. I guess I would you know, add my own uh, spin on that is I suppose failure can mean two things when I read this. Failure can mean, I, you know, if if there's a, 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 a sort of fiscal failure of some kind or, you know, a bailout that's necessary, but failure could also mean I, there's all our conversations sometimes of other municipalities are in the way of some sort of policy solutions that need to happen at the provincial level. So I'll, I'll throw both those uh, definitions of failure out there as uh, and you guys can answer the questions. Well, I'll address the fiscal issue. Um, you know, in in uh, the municipal acts or local government acts in each province, I mean, the, the province is on the hook when a municipality goes bankrupt and they come in as the supervisor uh, for the municipality to get their, their situation uh, back in order. So, so there is a rule for the province there. They have to do that uh, when there is a failure um, in the budget. Um, <clears throat> I was thinking of municipalities are usually better at blocking things than they are making things happen. So that's where I would think it would, you know, we're thinking of failure. So, you know, for example, I know I'm talking a lot about drugs today, but uh, when they did cannabis legalization, uh, municipalities, of course, were affected because we had to license all of these uh, cannabis stores and the city of Surrey said we're not providing any licenses to any stores and so um, the carrot with that was supposed to be a transfer of some of the revenues to the municipalities which the provincial government's never done they've just held all the revenues and never sent them their way just you know the municipality's way despite an agreement to do so um, so I, I do think that uh, you know municipalities may do this in order to um, in order to leverage something else out of the senior levels of government too. So uh, I would think my, my if a municipal government is blocking something, I would think uh, maybe some incentives are, are worthwhile. Uh, maybe that's when you use a one-time, uh, you know, conditional grant or unconditional grant to kind of woo the municipality over to compliance or then moving to some kind of uh, penalty. I think it's rare that you'd see the provincial government come in and, and you know, replace uh, municipal uh, government uh, or individual officials. And it's, it's really hard to get rid of municipal officials. Like councils can't do it themselves. You have to go to court, uh, you know, and um, so provinces might think of, of, of tinkering with those laws a little bit because some municipal politicians do atrocious things and still stay in office. Uh, so government policy at the local level is one thing, but individual activity is another. And, uh, and that's something that municipalities probably, you know, the provincial government should look at a little more, but uh, try to woo them over first. <laughs> if I, if I can just jump in, you, you know, the notion of local governments failing uh, is, is an interesting one because uh, would you ask the same question? What if provincial governments fail? Should the federal government come in? You know, local governments are, are elected, right? They're, they're mm -hmm. governments that are elected by the people. So this notion that, you know, it's okay to come in <laughs> and change what they're doing, uh, but it isn't at the provincial level, uh, is an interesting question. I, I just, through the pandemic, I did a survey of, uh, right at the beginning of my constituents of the residents, and I said, how many of you aren't going to be able to pay property tax this year? 25% of them said they couldn't because there were no federal programs in. So then I started to run that up the flagpole and say, holy crap, like this is, this will be catastrophic for us if we lose 
basically all of our user fee, uh, all our user fee, fee uh, you know, income, as well as 25% of our property tax revenue. I mean, as it was, we still had to lay off 18% of our employees. Like many, many municipalities did massive layoffs through COVID uh, and without strikes, which I think is, you know, nobody wants to talk about COVID anymore, but it was like a traumatic thing for municipalities in more ways than one. Uh, but um, again, the, the senior levels didn't seem as interested in listening to the front line, basically, which was uh, can be can be problematic. And hopefully we can learn lessons from, from that as we go forward. Um, a last question here from from the audience, uh, and Kennedy, I'll throw this one to you as um, I think it can, your experience both at the federal municipal level might be useful here. Um, you know, we've been talking about federal provincial municipal relationships. Uh, the question here is, how do you see the role of municipalities in improving relations with the indigenous governments and communities which mm. they share territory? Um, and the second part of the question is, you know, how do you see the division of responsibilities between the or the government? Um, when a municipality's action could have an impact on these ab indigenous uh, governance or communities? Oh, that's such a great question. Um, so we did a, when I first became mayor, my staff and I did a, um, like a stakeholder map. Um, and uh, the three local nations, Muscoon, Squamish, and Slayle Tooth, were at the top of that, even over the province for us. So everything that we we do, and it's a little different in British Columbia because we don't have treaties. These are unceded territories. Uh, and so we took uh, reconciliation very seriously. So everything we did, uh, major policy change, always started with me talking to the nations first, even before we talked to residents to see where they were. So SkyTrain uh, expansion at the University of British Columbia, the very first map that was generated, I went to the, the chief of the Musqueam, Wayne Sparrow, and I said, what do you think? And he was not keen on one station location. So we went back and altered it. And uh, so they they are at the core of everything. And, and in fact, it gives you leverage over the province, uh, especially in British Columbia's case, because they have uh, an ability to significant ability in the court. So it is and you know my number one uh, relationship so no olympics unless they're signed off by uh, the first nations uh, no so really essentially they on large policy decisions they had a veto which is uh, i i you know that was self imposed but um i think it's increasingly going to be the case yeah that makes sense ina do you have anything to add on on that or no i thought that was a great answer and i think vancouver's a good model so thank you and I guess we only have a few minutes left, Enid. I'll throw one last question to you that that I have, which is, you spoke a lot about the, the challenges going forward for municipalities, and you know we're coming out of you know major economic, uh, major COVID nineteen crisis, this inflationary crisis. These can seem like potentially things that we just have to let municipalities. Uh, help municipalities through as they are potentially, you know, hopefully are short term crises. But maybe can you just, you know, with the last couple minutes here, talk about the longer view and, you know, maybe the more structural challenges or opportunities that policymakers should be focusing on, consider, you know, assuming that hopefully we will get out of this, uh, this inflationary period and that COVID-19 will truly be behind us at some point. Well, those are assumptions. I mean, I assume we will get out of the inflationary period at some point. I'm not a macroeconomist, so I don't want to say for sure. Uh, whether we'll get out of the COVID impacts is another story, because, of course, you know, the whole transit fare revenues and transit ridership uh, is coming back very slowly and may not come back. But, you know, I, I think it goes back to what I was saying about the, the structural problems. I mean, what should municipalities be doing? And then how do we pay for it? And, you know, municipalities do a lot of different things. So they do things that are pretty much providing like private things with private good characteristics like water and, you know, things we can charge user fees for. Um, the property tax is good for those services uh, that have collective benefits where we can't identify the individual beneficiaries. We can't exclude those who don't pay um as we can with user fees so so there we have a property tax but if municipalities are getting into redistributive services like social services and public health 
the property tax and user fees aren't the way to go. We, we need to think more about income taxes. And then if they're providing services that cross municipal boundaries, you know, I talked about transfer. So we need to come up with a model. Once we figure out what we think municipalities should be doing, I think we then need to come up with a model of, well, user fees will work here, property taxes will work here. We may need income taxes or sales taxes and, and transfers. And so, you know, I think we have to think in those terms of, uh, of you know so much of the way municipalities work goes back to legislation from the 1800s and local governments don't look like that anymore you know back then it was roads and you know water and a few little things and we're talking about such major expenditures at the local level it can't be property taxes user fees and transfers i mean i think we need to uh think about how this whole system is structured and, and what needs to be done well, that's that's great. I think that's a really great note to end it on. So I just want to thank you, Enid. Thank you, Kennedy, for your presentations and for this discussion here. I, I found it really interesting. I hope everyone in the audience found it as interesting as I did. Your feedback is very important to us. And so uh, I invite you to complete the evaluation that's gonna, that you will receive in your emails in the next few days. The school has more events to offer you, and I encourage you to visit their website to keep up to date and register to all future learning opportunities. So once again, thank you, Enid. Thank you, Kenny. Thank you, everyone in the audience. I hope you all have a wonderful day. Thank you.